Hi everyone! In this week's scholarship chemistry tutorial session, I'm taking up question 3b from the 2015 exam. The first thing we need to do in this question is come up with all of the structures fitting the formula C5H802. They're all carboxylic acids because they all turn blue litmus paper red. Furthermore, your structures will only match this formula if they contain a carbon-carbon double bond. From this list of structures, we need to find the ones that match the descriptions of compounds A, B, C, and D, and these compounds A through D undergo further reactions to produce other structures we'll need to draw out. Those are compounds E through L. Okay, now compounds A through D all will react at some point in their description here with warm acidified potassium permanganate, and we're told in the information section when that happens, the double bond's going to break. That alkene double bond I've said is present in all of our isomers. It's going to break. And depending on how many hydrogens are attached to those carbons in the double bond, we're going to form different products. So if there are no hydrogen atoms present on that carbon, a ketone's formed. If there's one hydrogen present, carboxylic acids are going to be formed. And if there are two hydrogen atoms present, carbon dioxide is going to be formed instead. So to summarize those rules, I've drawn them out. Yeah, so we've got an alkene here. Both carbons have two hydrogens, so when I break the bond, we're forming two equivalents of CO2. Here we have a double bond, both carbons having one hydrogen, so when that double bond breaks, we're forming two equivalents of carboxylic acids. And when this double bond breaks, no hydrogens are present, we're forming two equivalents of ketones. Okay, those are the rules. Let's apply it to one of the uh, eight structures I came up with. Hopefully you came up with eight isomers as well. Let's uh, choose compound five. If I apply those rules to compound 5, if we react it with acidified permanganate here, we see that we'll form a ketone because this carbon has zero hydrogens, forms a ketone. This carbon has one hydrogen, so we can see that it, when the double bond breaks, this chunk here forms another carboxylic acid functional group there. Now, I've drawn uh, a further reaction step because there's one other thing in the information section I hadn't mentioned, and that's that when oxalic acid or ethyldioic acid is formed, in one of these reactions, it will further react with the permanganate that's already present in the reaction vessel to give two mole equivalents of CO2. So what is ethanedioic acid? If we break down the name, ethane meaning two carbons, dioic acid meaning two carboxylic acid functional groups, yeah, that's, that's what I just drew. That's the thing that formed when compound 5 reacts with acidified permanganate. So this is ethanedioic acid, and we see that according to the rules, it needs to form two equivalents of CO2. Okay, those are the rules to help us figure out compounds E through L. Let's apply it to um, uh, solving compound A. Rather than checking these rules with all of the structures, to, uh, all of those eight structures I came up with, let's just reveal the answers. So I found that of these eight compounds here, I found that compound A is actually compound five, the one we were just looking at. So with compound five, if it is compound A, it needs to react with permanganate as it does to form something that doesn't react with a, uh, with a sodium carbonate. We're told in the, in the rules it can't react with sodium carbonate. In other words, it's lost its carboxylic acid functional group. Yep, this one has, okay. And again, we form that ethanedioic acid to produce gas. And again, it says when compound A reacts with acidified permanganate, a colorless gas is observed. So this checks out. Okay, we're also told that uh, compound A reacts with water with an acid catalyst. So this is a hydration reaction and addition reaction we learned way back in level two. And uh, when we form the major product, which I've drawn here, uh, the major product uh, is not optically active. We see it's not op optically active because this carbon here has two identical groups. For it to be optically active, it needs a chiral carbon with four different groups. So this matches compound F as well. Okay, sweet. What about compound B? Well, I've found that uh, structure number four is compound B. It also produces carb um, compound F in, uh, as the major product of a hydration reaction. So that's nice, that checks out. Both compound five and four are able to form this structure in a hydration reaction. And compound B will react with acidified permanganate to form, a, once again, a colorless gas. And this structure here, compound G. Okay, so compound four is the best match for B. Awesome. What about compound C? We're told that it also reacts with permanganate. Cool, no surprise there. And when it does that, bubbles of gas are produced. Okay, Why, well that matches this structure because there's two hydrogens there. So we know that with when there's two hydrogens on a carbon and we break that bond, according to the rules, we're forming carbon dioxide. And this uh, carbon here is one hydrogen. It's going to form a carboxylic acid functional group. So that's the other structure, compound H. How do I know it's compound H? Well, I know according to the rules here, 
compound H needs to be able to uh, react with two mole equivalents of sodium hydroxide. In other words, it needs two acidic protons able to be neutralized by two equivalents of base. And yeah, we got that. One there, one there. Two functional groups. Cool. It matches the identity of compound H. All right. Compound C reacts with water with an acid catalyst once again. Another addition reaction is happening here to form compound I as the major product. So yeah, I've drawn the major product. That's compound I. It exists as enantiomers. So, if it's an enantiomer, if it's optically active, it needs to have a chiral carbon. Can you find it? It looks to be right there. It has four different groups. An OH group, a methyl group, a hydrogen, and this long alkyl group here, um, this chain right here. Okay, so it has four different groups. It's optically active. It definitely fits the description of compound I. Now, we're told one last thing. This is the most difficult part of the problem. This is pretty high level stuff, even for scholarship. We're told that compound I needs to react with concentrated sulfuric acid to form something that's not an alkene because it doesn't rapidly decolorize bromine water. Um, and that's normally what we expect when we react an, uh, an alcohol with concentrated sulfuric acid. We expect a dehydration reaction to happen and we're, we expect to form a double bond. But we're told that's not actually what's happening. Not only that, we're told that when uh, we use that compound, that concentrated sulfuric acid on compound I, it's actually not acidic either. It's neutral to litmus paper. So this functional group is destroyed somehow in this reaction. It's no longer going to be a carboxylic acid either after this reaction happens. Um, so I'm going to reveal the complex high-level mechanism that happens uh, in this process. Um, if you don't know about uh, mechanisms, nucleophiles, electrophiles, this is all going to seem a little bit too much. Maybe pause the video uh, at this point and have a look at this diagram. Come talk to me if you're, you're a bit confused. Um, basically, um, the H plus represents the acid uh, from the sulfuric acid, and uh, what I've drawn here is the movement of electrons, um, pairs of electrons, towards the positive center. In mechanisms, electrons or regions of negativity are always moving towards positivity, and we see that what happens is this uh, relatively straight chain molecule rearranges itself to form something pretty cyclic, and this is compound J in the end. We see that it's lost its carboxylic acid functional group, that fits the identity. It, there's also no alkene um, in the compound uh, to rapidly decolorize bromine. So it fits the identity as well. So uh, please pause the video or talk to me if you want to understand mechanisms a little bit more. Again, this is pretty high level, even for scholarships to expect something like this, which I've never seen in a level three uh, textbook of any sort. Okay, even a little footnote was never made I've ever seen. Okay, let's move along to the last part, compound D. Compound D, we're told, reacts with Again, acidified permanganate to give a colorless solution containing two compounds, K and L. Titration of this mixture requires two mole equivalents of hydroxide. So, yep, uh, we better have um, a total of two acidic protons, and we do. One on this structure, one on this one. Um, if I check the other possible structures on my list, where's my list here? If I check the other structures on my list, uh, here it is, um, the ones that are... are candidates, I find that, for example, for this structure here, number two, if I were to oxidize it with permanganate, the, the structures would actually have three uh, um, acidic equivalents protons I can neutralize, because there's one there, and we know that when this double bond breaks, we're going to form two units of carboxylic acids, so that's a total of three acidic hydrogens. That's why carbon two, or compound two, cannot be compound D. Um, there are several other structures in here that when we oxidize them with permanganate and break that bond, will also form a total of three carboxylic acid functional groups. So that's the reason why compound D has to be number seven. We oxidize that, that turns into a carboxylic acid functional group, and um, this does not, this will form a ketone because there's no hydrogens attached to it. So we see that we formed a ketone there. Okay. So we've successfully identified compounds A, B, C, and D. We've figured out uh, compounds E through L, uh, fr all from the eight structures here. Okay. Thanks for watching. Hope that was helpful.